What up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Gym Report. I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me, as always, is Mr. Brian Shows. Brian, got a lot of news to go over. Some interesting news. Some news. I, you know what I got to do now from now on? Today is April 14th of 2022. So that way is in people's minds. When we say things, they can put a date to it. Because there's a lot of interesting stuff that's happening that we sort of talked about last summer that is playing out almost to the T, Brian. Um, some news, Blue Beetle already. People getting like, you know what? I don't I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm out. We don't know what happened there, but it sounds like that sounds like it could have been the case. Uh, Moon Knight episode three. Brian, things are getting really interesting, man. They, they just find a way to keep us hooked in. And I, I, I really like this episode. Um, some more news regarding Tom Cruise appearing at Iron Man. I'm not too sure about, cause that's something that people have been talking, people have been talking about for quite some time already. I don't know what you heard regarding, I didn't read the article that you sent me. So I want to, I want you to elaborate on that, on what you read. Um, Amber Heard, and this is something that we talked about quite some time ago and this was something that they were talking about they considered it so we weren't too far off they just i don't know why they decided to keep amber heard um we don't know if that'll hurt the box office for uh aquaman but let's see uh again the toys ruin things brian <laughs> yes they do it's like we were waiting for the but big I actually reveal. Blame, I actually blame Marvel a little bit on this one. Because they're okay. running late. They're running late True that. footage. True that. So in this that, case, I actually feel like somebody said forget it. Let's <laughs> not as out. angry. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um Doctor Strange ticket sales, Brian. Mm -hmm. We have been talking about for quite some time that Doctor Strange is gonna make bank at the theaters, man. It could be, I mean, for Marvel stuff, you have to ask the question, is it going to get to a billion dollars? For the most part, most of these movies will. Um, but Doctor Strange is, is looking to do some unprecedented numbers, numbers that I wouldn't have, like, if you would have told me, can it make this number? Can I mean, I would be like, I don't think so. Can it make a billion? Of course, I think so. Marvel pretty much anything to put out is 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 worth um having the conversation but uh we'll get into that um charlie Theron for some reason decided to take it upon herself to produce a, a aqualad series for hbo max why i do not know we'll i, I guess we'll speculate on that um supposedly there was a reveal. I think this was an oopsie daisy. This was an oopsie daisy, Brian. And they tried to hide it. Well, oh, this is a joke sort of situation. But who knows? With you. This dude Waldron is 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 a is a marvel at writing these things and really getting us uh, making us understand what's going on. This guy is is pretty good. Uh, um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, Warner Brothers Discovery. This this is referring to my opening, I guess, monologue regarding the title, the dates uh, of these shows, so that you guys can connect the times. Well, like, oh, say he said it this time ago. This this how long ago? Um, Warner Brothers is looking to do everything that we say. What we, we were um, thinking that they were going to do. What they should do what they have to do if they want to be successful, if they want to compete with Marvel. If they want that that bread that Marvel's making hand over fist. They have to do something. And they're looking at this IP because there's a lot of potential there. Um, first, uh, I just want to, I said I was going to start to show off with this real quick. Brian, my Cyclops for X-Men we talked a little, I, th I think I've mentioned Pablo Shriver, but I also was thinking Justin Hartley 
from This Is Us. Green, Green Arrow from Smallville. And he was Aquaman in the CW's failed pilot for, or pilot for the failed show that they tried to do I don't know when Smallville was going. Okay, so you want him to do round three for, for, for a superhero. Yeah. He's a tall guy. That's one thing. Like, just like, I don't know if people know that. He's like 6'3 in real life. Who's he's that? Pretty, Justin Hartley. Okay. So, like, he he's a pretty he's a pretty big guy. And, like, if you go back to – he's older now, but if you go back to, like, his Smallville days and when he was, um, aqua, like, young Arthur Curry, like, he – he, I could see it. I could see him with a vibe. He's got a lot of personality, and the Cyclops really hasn't been done right. What now? Why do you think? Why do you think he's a good fit for the personality of the Cyclops? You want I think, to see? I think visually he is. Uh, he looks good for the for the for the role. That's number one. I Cyclops to me has has been a devout follower of Professor X. He almost looks at him as a father figure. If you if you watch. If any of you have watched the X-Men series, watch the final episode of the of the X-Men animated series, the final episode before we never saw it again. And, and, and then we got like X-Men evolutions and all this other stuff that came out after it. But he considered him as a father figure. And he is quite he he's a leader he's like a captain america of that team yeah. right he he's a leader and he uh, and i think he just i think he can fit the personality of cyclist being that devout follower of, of professor x and, and and really believing in his message and his goal of having humanity um accept mutants so uh i think that will be That'll be a good choice if they decide to go that route. You know, a, you reference kind of the the, the leader. I, I actually think of him more as like a big brother. That's that's kind of how I always saw him within the team, especially the way the animated series portrayed it, which obviously causes friction. You know, with Wolverine in particular, who doesn't really take too well to being commanded by anyone, let yeah. alone someone in his his eyes who's a lot younger and less experienced because Wolverine obviously has been around a long time. So, <laughs> yeah. but other than the original, you know, other than, than the original Brian Singer film, that's not a dynamic they ever really explored. You know, they kind of, James Marsden and Hugh Jackman kind of got into it a little bit in that very first X-Men movie. But then I feel like the writers just didn't know what to do with Cyclops. And then yeah. because Hugh hit it so big off that original movie, he just mm -hmm. kind of gobbled up like the space, you know? So then it kind of was like, all right, well, if we're going to make Wolverine far and away the, the star, you know, Gene was his love interest as well. So then Gene Gray kind of got elevated and just felt like in every person, every progressive movie, Cyclops just got pushed more and more to the side. So I don't think we've really seen a Cyclops that's been allowed to be the Cyclops that was written in, in the comics. Yeah. So that would be yeah. my number one hope for whoever gets this part is like, you know, give them a leadership role and give them give them romance with Gene, give them conflict with Wolverine and some of the other members of the team because that's central to the character. That romance and with Gene said, has to be believable. The devotion, the devotion to Professor X's philosophy and trying to do things the right way. And the devotion to Gene, I got to believe that because in the X-Men animated series, they are in, listen, Cyclops, as soon as she leaves the, the house, he's like, yo, where's Gene? <laughs> <laughs> he is like in love like in obsessed you know yeah. um so i gotta believe that that relationship a little bit i think they they forced that relationship on us in the in in the the x-men uh, movies and stuff it was just there already just like it was in the animated series but i guess because there's a series that sort of grew on you um but also how Cyclops was towards X-Men and his relationship to the other team members. They got to explore that. And it's going to be a difficult task to do that all in one film, however they decide to do it. Yeah, I agree. I think, I think the, the animated series, the way they, that Cyclops was played very straight, very mature. And as you said, very emotional Yeah, at all times. I do think the Cyclops I envision has a little bit more of 
don't want to say a sense of humor, but it has a little bit more cynic, not cynicism, but has a little bit more of like the playful side. And I actually think that's something that you would expect with like kind of effectively students at a school or whatever. And so Harley does that very well. If you've ever, if you did go watch him, even in This Is Us, which obviously has a pretty dramatic show, but yeah. he has a good lighter side. It's interesting. I think if you want a darker, more brooding Cyclops, your Schreiber idea works better. I think Pablo Schreiber is probably a stronger dramatic um, kind of, as I said, like if, if you wanted Cyclops who was kind of more lost in sort of his own thoughts or withdrawn, then you'd go that route. If you want the more kind of brash, maybe a little bit younger seeming leader of the group, maybe, maybe Harley. That, I think that could be an inspired choice. So, and he's, I would have to think his star is pretty big right now coming off of This Is Us, which is ending. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this would be the good time to snatch him up if he's looking for a project and if uh, Marvel's looking for a Cyclops, I think he'd probably be your guy. Um, let us begin with Mr. Mr. Knight, Mr. Moon Knight, episode three. Brian, what did you think of this episode? I like the way they keep us guessing as to what's going on. I like, I don't know who, who's who almost, right? Because Stephen Grant in the beginning, he was like a nobody, he's a, but now he's a little bit, you know, he's the intelligent dude. But there's another side to his personality where he's sort of charismatic, right? Um, and people are talking about this guy, Jake uh, Locklear or something Lock like that. Yeah, the third, the, the other known personality from the comics, yeah. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. The I'm still looking for the rich guy, but I don't think we're there yet. I don't know where we're at and how they're going about doing this. What were your thoughts on this episode? Um, uh yeah, let me tell me what you thought. I liked it. I mean, I texted you immediately. So this is a very interesting episode. I, this is a, I mean, we could probably do an entire show on this particular episode, but I think we got something we predicted, which was they flipped the perspective. So this was a Mark Spector led show. Yes. Uh, where Steven was kind of riding shotgun and was yes. thump, you know, kind of thump, get tagged in effectively at certain points but then you're right the tease of jake lockley who is i think of the of kind of the the major personalities in mark and habits he's one of the darker ones he's definitely one of the less more like more immoral kind of doesn't have a line and that's why you see the reaction to you know like he's he's wiping out dudes and both both specter and grant like i didn't I didn't do that. What you talking about? So I like that because it is going to explore. I think allow Oscar Isaac to be closer to almost full villain, even yeah. as he portrays kind of the protagonist role. So clearly that's coming. I think we, you know, I don't know if we'll get an episode fully from Jake's perspective, but certainly that's the tease is that we're going to get that idea. Um, and the show, I think, look, I mean, the show, I don't know how you feel, the show is kind of at its strongest when it's letting, I think, when it's letting Oscar Isaac inhabit, not just the one personality, but have them interplay, which I think has become, you know, pretty enjoyable to watch. How um, my, did you get, how did you accept, or how did you react to Oscar Isaac changing from, I think it was Mark Spector to Steve, there was no like, he didn't like you didn't get it. He didn't get like possessed or anything like that. He's just sort of like it was a gradual switch and it looked seamless. How, how did you react to that? Yeah, it was. I'm not totally sure how I feel about how seamless a team they've become in some ways. I feel like they were so at odds in the initial episode as Stephen was discovering that there was another personality. Yeah. And now, like I said, they they almost kind of acted like a tag team, you know, during the fight. We're like, you take it, you take it, you know. And I'm like, did we skip a step there? Did we skip a step of them being more awkward side by side? But but I like it's entertaining. Like I like seeing Oscar Isaac flip the switch on his own acting. Like in the same scene, it actually yeah, makes yeah, for yeah. compelling television. He's very good at it. Yes. Um, like he does stuff with like his eyebrows and his eyes and his face. Like you, you immediately know like who he is without even hearing the voice, which obviously is very different, which is a testament to him as an actor. So I'm really enjoying that. I mean, as I said, yeah. this is his, I think there's, I think there's Emmy potential. I think he definitely, like if you just said like, 
of the roles on TV and what he's being asked to do, like he's definitely in the top shelf in terms yeah. of difficulty. So I think yeah, he's yeah, doing yeah. a great job and I'm enjoying what his work. Um, how do you feel about the night, the moon, the actual moon night side of this? Because I'm a little still not totally sold on that part of it. It's hard to say. I think Oscar Isaac's performance with all the different uh, personalities, I'm I'm more interested in that than Agreed. the Moon Knight stuff. Um, it hasn't really impressed me that much. Um, hopefully, it gets a little better. But I'm satisfied with how the show is going, but not necessarily um, intrigued by the Moon Knight character. More of I'm more intrigued with Steve, uh, Stephen, uh, Mark, uh, and the new guy. Whoever I'm interested in those characters, whoever he is going to be, uh, that's what I'm more, more, more mostly interested in. But the action sequences, you know, they they have their flashes of of, 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 of good visuals and and fighting and stuff. But it's like there's nothing you've never. It's not like something you've you haven't seen before. How do you think about it? Same. I, I, I think it's, this was, because this was the first episode where we got a little bit of the taste of Moon Knight in action and stuff that we hadn't really seen in the trailers. Yeah. And I kind of was a little underwhelmed. Like, I think the suit looks good, but the choreography is kind of just <clears throat> average to me. Like, I don't yeah, think yeah. he's, you know, he will make the Batman comparison between the characters, but like, I don't see really any of that. Like that, you know, Batman, as he's shown on film, especially like in the warehouse scene that Zack Snyder put together, like far more impressive, like far more, yeah, far yeah, more yeah. athletic, uh, far more creative in how they deployed him. And, and so this one, it kind of felt like, okay, he's in a white suit and he's got some powers, but, and he's got obviously the things that he can throw or, you know, but like, I don't know, I, I, I'm with you. Like, I'm almost like, I started the show thinking we needed more of it. And now I'm kind of thinking like, we don't need a lot of it. Like I'm kind of fine not seeing a ton of the character um, in that form. So yeah, that's probably been one of my critiques of the show would be that. Um, what Is do you think going of, on you? I like it. I mean, I, like, as I said, I like the fact that the, the avatar and the God are both physically present and visible. As I said, I think there's a real important distinction from the Venom situation where it's the same voice altered, Tom Hardy talking to Tom Hardy. I like that it's F. Murray Abraham, who has a great voice, even though it's altered, talking to Oscar Isaac and them being able to see each other. I mm -hmm. think it's it's working for it's working okay for me. Um, and I think it's I'm very intrigued by where the whole God storyline is going because now we've been introduced to these other deities right in this episode which i thought was one of the cooler yeah, like, yeah. reveals and moments where it's like oh we're kind of opening this universe up a little bit and like uh, are these characters are any of these characters going to be around beyond just the show mm -hmm. um so i, I kind of like i like that sequence what, what do you think of how they're how they're using Kanchu, like when to show him when he talks like how he's talking how do you like that well he's showing up a lot more um, I like that we don't know what his plans are. We're sort of getting teases of what Kashu is trying to accomplish. I'm not quite sure of what he's trying to accomplish yet. But with this episode, obviously they open it up to multiple uh, gods deciding or trying to figure out what's going on and what Kanshu is trying to do and what Arthur Harrow is trying to uh, uh, accomplish as well. So there's a lot of things going. Um, I have to sit with the episode a little bit more to really try to, to understand. Although I think, cause I watched it and, I, and I'm like, trying to understand what's going on or what's trying to be accomplished. 
it's kind of weird for me. I don't know, I guess. So I liked, this is a good Arthur Harrow episode, I thought. Mm -hmm. Hawk is doing a nice job. So I think Hawk is doing a nice job of drawing you in with this guy always seems like he's a step ahead. He's always calm and he's always in command, but he's going to go unhinged at some point. And I think it's going to be amazing to see. Like everything is pointing toward, to me, like there's going to be this moment of, there's this other side to the cult leader's personality and we, he's going to put it on full display. And I'm pretty excited to see that. I feel like he's really like kind of coiling the spring for something that's going to be pretty fun to watch. Do you think he is going to have not necessarily a Moon Knight personality, but he will become something similar to Moon Knight? I'm assuming he becomes Amit's like Amit's true avatar that looks more like a supervillain type of form. But I just mean emotionally. Yeah, yeah. Because he he seems to always know what's what to say, what's going to happen. He's been inside the head of Kanchu. Everything's been so controlled that I have to think it's a setup to then he's going to lose control or deliberately lose control at some point in the show. And I think I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Although I'm kind of with you in that again with the as. Other than Loki, we're three episodes in and we're still not totally clear like where we're going and we're checking the watch and being like, hey, we've only got three more episodes to get get to the break point of this season one, assuming it is season one. So that's what I keep thinking about, Brian, the most is like, yo, there's only six episodes. We're already halfway and we have so much, so many more questions. Yeah. So it's like, I'm getting, I, I, I have to be honest, I'm getting a little bit frustrated with the amount of episodes that they're putting out for these series. Like you want more? I want at least eight to 10, man. Eight, you want eight, okay. Eight, eight, eight to 10, eight to 10. Uh, I don't want to feel like after the six episodes, like, mm, I don't know, I, even though I, it's not a fair comparison to compare this to, uh, what's it called? Um, the show that we saw with Star Wars, uh, Mandalorian or Book of Fett? Book of Fett. I thought we were going to get a season two because they were talking about all these things, and I can't, they can't possibly finish this in the in the last episode, right? And that's exactly what happened. Yeah. So, so many things going on with Moon Knight. It's hard to think. Like, wow, this is only six episodes. We're already halfway done. So let's see, man. Hopefully it's not a disappointing uh, 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 ending to this. Well, this can't be an ending, though. That's the thing. I mean, the one thing that's different about this series versus the ones we're talking about there and even the other MCU series, new yeah. character, right? So this is clearly a character that is yeah. meant to populate the broader world of, of the not just this phase of Marvel, but maybe the next phase of Marvel. So in that sense, it can't end. I just don't want to feel like we rushed to the end of the chapter, if that makes sense. Like I would rather the show take its time. And as I said, part of what made Loki's finale so great is that they kind of ignored the fact that it was the finale, right? They, they gave you a payoff in the form yeah. of Kang, but yeah, yeah, yeah. it almost was like chapter one of the next thing and it worked yes. brilliantly. brilliantly like, it's like yes, you reach yes. this point where you felt like all right there is a pause here we've yeah. we've, we've we've evolved the story but we made no attempt to wrap anything up and exactly. in doing so we actually made a better finale so of i course. hope because we we're hearing that there's a season two and we know that oscar isaac didn't sign up i don't think just to do six episodes of tv i hope that this is a launch pad and we're left with good questions right i'm fine being left with good questions as long as i don't feel like i was rushed to get there but uh, from what i heard contractually he's only signed up for one we're assuming that he's going to sign up for a second i guess part of why i think that would be the case is you know it is a new character you never know how it's going to play but i'm kind of saying if the ratings have been pretty good the viewership's been pretty good there's pretty good buzz around this show yeah yeah Mar from marvel's perspective now they're like okay there's appetite for more of yeah. this character like now we now we need to start thinking about where does he slot into the films 
where does he slot into other shows? And Oscar Isaac is a, you know, he's an Academy Award nominated actor. That's a guy that can sell for you if, if yeah, you've yeah. got the right character. So that that's that's my hope. But I'm kind of with you. It's like there's a, a lot of a lot of table setting. And as you said, if they bring Lockley in to episode four and you have to spend time with a new personality, now you're down to two episodes where you're trying <laughs> to kind of get this done. And like, yeah, you're right. The, 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 it, it looms large, the FET risk, the, Cap, the, the Falcon Winter Soldier risk, like all that stuff that we've experienced with Marvel. I'm still waiting to see how, how all this started. I, I, I would assume that there's still, a, there's an episode of that, or at least some storytelling of what, how this, all came to be so let's see let us know in the comment section below what you thought of episode three moon night and if you'd you also agree? like the world building though because madripoor getting dropped into the middle ah of the yes, yes yes ah, yes you yes, guys yes. always want to kind of remind <laughs> us that you know there's these other connectivities out there of course there, you know? yes 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 yeah um yeah let us know in the comment section below do you think we should get at least eight to ten episodes of something like this where 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 there's just so many questions to answer and with each episode there's just more and more questions like who's this who's that what's going on it's just very very interesting this show uh, is still slotting second for me though like episodes one, two, three, compared to one, two, three of the other Marvel shows. This is still number two behind Loki so far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, next up. Uh, Charlize Theron. I don't know the full story, Brian. I don't know what compelled her to say, I want to do this. Because to me, it's like... I think it has to do with a lot of um, inclusion. Because Aqualad, I believe, A, he's black, yeah. right? Correct. I think he's uh, gay, right? Yep. Um, perhaps this is a story that she wants to tell and, and there's an audience for it. But who knows? What are your thoughts on how far this goes? And, and I think, you know, Warner Brothers may, uh, or Warner Brothers Discovery may have something to say about this. But what are your thoughts on this uh, potential HBO Max series? So just to get the specs here, so the, the the series is being based, it is a series, not a film, okay. yeah. based on the graphic novel, You Brought Me the Ocean. That's the Aqualad story they're using because Aqualad does exist in a couple of storylines. That's the, that's mm -hmm. the inspiration. And yeah, so Charlize Theron at the moment is listed as a producer on this series. Okay. Uh, no word at all as to whether she would appear in the series, although I would have to think even if it's just a cameo or a small role, she probably will. Mm -hmm. um, she has not offered any comment yet as to why this particular story is personal to her or why she would want to put her name on it. But usually there's, you know, usually you see these associations, you're like, there's a reason, there's something here that she's yeah. interested in, in getting up on the screen. So um, it, um, I guess I file it, you know, you, you hit on the inclusion point. I guess for me though, I'm sort of filing this in this category of, you know, it's, it's a coin flip as to whether it actually happens because of what we're going to talk about at the end of the episode. And, you know, I think projects like this, um, you know, the Val Zod project, the Ta-Nehisi Coach Superman project. Like, I think a lot of these projects are effectively auditioning for dollars yeah. coming out of the combined entity. And I think at the end, you know, there's, there's no writer, there's no showrunner, there's no star. So this is very conceptual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's why I say like, odds that this actually makes it to a full season one buy-in from WB, at best, I think it's 50-50. Uh, I think Charlie Theron's name is interesting, but like, quite honestly, like I said, show me a director, show me a writer, show me a star, show me, show me a name that I, in those areas that I should 
sit up and pay attention to. And then I might get more kind of serious about where this could go. I, at the moment, I'm just sort of very question mark TBD on it. I said some time ago that the success of Spider-Man will lead to more characters in that same age group to come out and wanting to do the younger hero that kids or teenagers. Yep. Um, we have Miss Marvel. Oh, we have Young Beetle. Avengers clearly being Young set up. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, so this could be also another character that they want to throw into the fold. But again, we have to discuss um, the Warner Brothers Discovery uh, situation to see whether or not some of these things make sense. So, yeah, like you said, TBD. Let us know in the comment section below what you guys think about this uh, possibility. Next up, Amber Heard. Listen, we talked about this initially when it first came out where, you know, she, you know Johnny Depp being her, her former husband. They were married, right? Yep. Um, and they had their situation and they went to court and, and all that stuff. And Johnny Depp, I think, has a lot of fans. He has, you know, he has a good following of people that like his work or whatever. Um, and you heard people talking about, you know, not wanting her in the films. And I think there was a petition at yeah, some point. Like a million and a half signatures. So we had said at that time that it's a possibility that, that Warner Brothers may be thinking about letting her go because of this, because it could hurt the movie. They made a billion dollars last time. They're trying to make that billion again. And they considered it. It has come out. They were talking about it. Obviously, that hasn't... Uh, occurred we, she's still going to be in the movie brian right she's still going to be in the movie nothing is shot so yeah yeah I mean, as yeah, far as we yeah. know as far yeah so. yeah so but what are your thoughts on on this on the that they actually thought about it and should should they have i don't know if they should have done it they, if they should have like let her go that thing i think that thing would have uh, i think it would have caused more problems for them if they did uh, but what are your thoughts on this whole uh, Amber Heard situation? Yeah, so the reason why this has come back to the fore is because she's actually, the, her trial with Johnny Depp is now happening in, yes. in Europe. It's it, public. And it's it happening in the Amber US, Heard's, right? Uh, I guess you're it right. Is it, 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 it happened in Europe it and he lost. In Europe. It's happening, it's happening now, here. Yes. But it was Amber Heard herself who actually made this news because in her statements, in her statements, she talked about that this situation with Depp had hurt her career in multiple ways. And one of the ways she alluded to was that her part in Aquaman was effectively put up in the air between Aquaman 1 and Aquaman 2, mm -hmm. and that there was a real discussion about her not being brought back. And then when she was brought back, she was brought back at a much lower level of compensation than the uh -huh. other stars of the movie because she was viewed as having baggage because of this situation. So Walter Hamada actually is one of the witnesses in this case, the head of DC um, Entertainment over at Warner Brothers. So that's kind of what has brought this back up for people. Now, oh, so Hamada confirmed that the studio deliberated as to whether to let her go. What I also found interesting was they were highly concerned about her, quote, chemistry with Jason Momoa on the set. I had not heard that in the filming, that they had had problems. I mean, and quite honestly, like, you know, the movie's so kind of campy and silly. I didn't really think much of like their on-screen. It was fine for what the movie needed, right? This isn't a, this isn't like a, this isn't a romance, you know, that's yeah. going to like last the ages, right? It's a, it's yeah. a fun light thing. I, but he, he chose to make that statement, you know, under oath in the trial. And so that, 
I found that kind of interesting that that like they basically told me they didn't like her performance. They didn't like how she played with Jason Momoa. And I guess you're right. I mean, I there's a part of me that's like, why, why did they kind of go to bat for her at all? Like she doesn't strike me as I think we had a discussion last time. Is she absolutely necessary to the franchise? Like, I don't think so. I mean, you could recast Mira, like that wouldn't yeah, be the end of the yeah. world. Yeah, but you maybe you're right. Maybe like they didn't want her sue in the studio. Maybe there was other things that they were like, hey, it's just easier to let it be yeah. and let it continue. Now, because this trial is so public and you know, we're not going to take a stand on what's going to happen, but the point is we're going to get all the details. Mm. There's still risk here with this thing running now and the film set to come out in early 2023 would not be ideal if we happen to get some gnarly details on Amber Heard's side of this that happened to coincide with the promotional tour for this film. That would not be ideal because everybody is then going to get asked about it at all these press junkets. And that's not what you want as a studio. Yeah. Especially not when you're already dealing with Ezra Miller's situation on the limbo flash. It's, it's 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 a very dicey situation. Very interesting situation. Uh, um, yeah, that's a very interesting situation. That's a lot of time before when that that hearing starts, so that 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 court situation starts, and the movie comes out and. Is this gonna be like public? Are people gonna talk about it? And you know, in, in like, are, are, is the yeah. press gonna be okay? The entire thing is public. Every witness, text messages, everything is public record. Everything is public domain. That's why there's the part of me that feels like the studio might have been better off just recasting her and saying, "All right, we're gonna have to cut her a check. We're gonna have to cut her a check to get rid of her." But like this movie's fortunes might be better if we're like, I'm just gonna make up a name who has who has already has red hair. Sophie Turner, here's a bag full of cash. Come in and be Mira. Yeah, or or do what Marvel does, get somebody new and build their career, make it dope for that person, whoever they choose to to bring in. Um, I probably would have done what she's saying, like, you know, his, but still, you know, even even still, stuff would have came out. Because of that, who knows if she still sues? Who knows if the movie makes a billion dollars? She got what twenty million or whatever. Who knows? It's just a, it's just a bad situation for them. So I mean, I guess they they said let's just deal with it. Jason Momoa is a star. I think we can bring in another billion dollars with just him. Even though, like you, I, I think you were saying, I think she, Amber Heard's uh, uh, mirror is important to uh, Aquaman because in the Justice League and uh, Justice League animated series uh, Unlimited. You know that's his wife. They they have a kid. You know he's the king. You know so that all that stuff. I don't know how far they're going with this. I doubt they're going there. I don't want to see that. I'm done. I was done after the first one, but we're getting a second one. I don't know what that's going to look like. Most likely nothing like Avatar, but let's see. Let's see. Um, yeah, let us know in the comment section below. Would you have gotten rid of Amber Heard if you were in that position? Let us know in the comment section below. You know, the other thing you could have done is uh -huh. you could have killed her off in the script. True. You said, you're back in the movie. Fulfill the contract. Here's a script. You're done in the third act. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just saying that that wouldn't be the first time we've seen the character. It could have happened because we ain't getting an three. actor at odds, and that yeah, was yeah, the yeah. solution. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, next up, Sharon Stone said, "I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm out." 
She read the script. She just said, oh, we want to be in a Blue Beetle movie. We're giving you X amount of money. She read the script. It's like, what the hell is this? Nah, I don't want to do this. So they hired, they got Susan Sarandon to replace her as the villain. That's the way I think it went down, Brian. Sharon Stone didn't want no part of this after reading the script. Not because the script is bad, because I, I just don't, she already had her taste in Catwoman. You're saying that they probably, and you texted me, you said that. Um, oh, I was joking took, about that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a possibility. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? They saw her in, in Catwoman and said, like, oh, no, nah, no. Nah. But I'm pretty sure, I, I, I feel like Sharon Stone said ah, she changed her mind. What are your thoughts? So I, I tend to agree. Like This was something where they were negotiating with her about a part that was being created for the film, which I think is yeah. the most important thing here, right? This is not a character that you can pull a comic off a shelf as an actor yeah, yeah. or a director and be like, here, here's what we want. Here's what we're thinking. Here's the vision. This is something new, which means you, you, both sides have to buy in. I think you're, you're sort of right. I think the other part I would just throw in there is it's like, you know, I'm sure Sharon Stone wanted input, right? And it could just be like, hey, the, the vision she had for how big the part should be, what the character should be and how it should be played, creative differences too. It could just be like, that's not what the studio had in mind. They weren't willing to be like, we want a smaller part. We don't want a bigger part, you know? And so she said, no, Susan Sarandon said, yes. Now, I, what I do think is interesting, but like, you know, not to say they have no range, but yeah. I think for most people, how we think of Sharon Stone and her style of acting is very different than Susan Sarandon. I mean, Sharon Stone is the seductress. She's kind of the, like, you never, you always think she has a dark side. Yeah. Susan Sarandon is kind of more like the good, the, the lighter side, you know, kind of more the, you know, and even when she plays a villain, like, or not a villain, but like in Thelma and Louise, she's an outlaw. It's like a lovable outlaw. Yeah. yeah. This is it tonally, these are pretty different actresses based on the work of yeah. their career. So, the fact that they view this as interchangeable makes me wonder, you know, has the part gone in a little bit of a different direction too? Where they're like, hey, like this is now the mood that we want this character, which is supposed to be a villain. We want, this is the mood we want to portray. So I'm still kind of like interested because these are two of the biggest actress names from like the 1990s. And what are they doing in a Blue Beetle movie? Like, I'm just kind of curious to see, but. I am curious as well, but concerned. Yeah, because as I said, they have to be the villain behind the villain. Because Blue Beetle has got to be able to fight and be toe to toe with somebody that makes sense. And, you know, Joel <laughs> Omar Duena, as a teenager or a college age, whatever, going to slot him as up against a 60 something <laughs> is, is a little. Just doesn't look. Feels good. like there's something in between there. We need to see. Yeah, man. Let us know. In the comment section below what you guys think about this uh replacement and what you guys think went down next up tom cruise superior iron man brian there's some rumors that he is in talks to play superior iron man in secret wars brian what's so, this all about yeah there's a lot there's a, i mean look the tom cruise in doctor strange 2 has been you know all over the the internet for a, a while um, there are people who, who have tried to freeze frame the last trailer claiming that he's in it, that you can see Superior Iron Man, that it's not a Marvel that you're seeing on screen, you're seeing Superior Iron Man, even though the suit isn't white, like it isn't white yeah. and blue, like it is in the comics. But this story that came out this week was that he was in negotiations or in talks to, to be Superior Iron Man beyond Doc Strange 2, that he was going to play the role in a Secret Wars film, which you and I have always felt was coming, but had never been directly referenced before. Yeah. I mean, who knows? But I mean, I know you have thoughts, but this is a, if so, if Tom Cruise is really going to come to the MCU in a, in a meaningful way, that strikes me as a bit of a departure from how they've done business over the past 15 years, because Tom Cruise is, he's a production unto himself. Not all in a bad way. It's just, it's just the stature he has as an actor. And we can talk about it, whether it's Top Gun or, you know, or whether it's Mission Impossible, he has a certain way of operation that is a yeah. little bit different than the way Marvel has operated. 
I think Tom Cruise is willing to play ball. I think he knows that Marvel is Marvel. I think obviously he's going to have a say at the table. Um, but I think he's going to play ball. Uh, not to the point where he has to walk off like Ed Norton or something like that. Um, but I think he, uh, the first thing that's going through my head is when are we getting the Secret Wars? Because is this dude, how old is Tom Cruise? Uh, he's almost 60, in the late 50s. When so it's like when are we getting Secret Wars? You know what I'm saying? That's what I'm. That's what I'm thinking. Like, cause Secret Wars to me looks something like five years out, right? Um, depends on what's what we get in these next films. Do we get an indication of uh, how close is this to happening? So that sort of is the thing. I mean, I can see Tom Cruise playing the role and and, and, and it'll be an interesting role. It'll be a fun role. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing something like that. But how soon are we going to get it is, you know, Tom Cruise is not a young, he's not a young buck, but uh, let's see. Let's see. That's, that's what I keep thinking about. Well, I think I think it's perfectly reasonable, given knowing what we know about Tom Cruise. I think within if you gave him five years, I think he could go in a cave, make the superior <laughs> Iron Man suit, and learn how to fully operate it by that time. I think I, I, I buy that. If he told yeah. me he was going to do it, I would actually believe that guy. He would make it look real. Look, I the thing that the thing that puzzles me a little bit, like I said, is. And, and, Tom Cruise always has final cut on every movie he does, which means he effectively is the director. So there's the director and then who delivers the footage, but it's Cruise who makes the final call on what shot you see go up on the screen. That's what I mean by, that's not something that Marvel has typically done, right? They've always retained control of the properties. Now, they're obviously playing ball with Ryan Reynolds, who has a lot of control over Deadpool. But as I said, if you hire crews, he typically doesn't just show up, take orders and leave. And so I'm, I'm just curious to see, especially Secret Wars is an ensemble picture. You know, can he really be one of 25 name characters and actors that would, you know, 30? I mean, it's gonna be a big production. Can he do that? You know, not every big, I mean, I mean, Downey, to his credit, as big of a star as he became, always seemed willing to back off in those movies. He was willing, he, he got his shine, but he was always willing to put over a Tom Holland or someone else. It's not been Cruz's MO for the last 20 years. I think he's going to play ball in this one. Because... There's a lot of money to be made if he does. There's no True. question. I'll say this to anybody coming into the MCU and thinking that they can come in and 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 kick the door down and say this is how it's gonna go. Because for anyone thinking that, they're gonna be made aware very quickly that the MCU is much bigger than any one person. You may have your individuals who are fantastic at what they do, and they probably will take input from that person because how important that person is, right? But I think, although we want Tom Cruise or some people want to see this Tom Cruise superior Iron Man thing, it doesn't have to happen, if it, especially if it gets complicated. So, on the plus side, on the plus side, Superior Iron Man is a villain. When was the last time Tom Cruise put Collateral. his villain hat on? When? Collateral. That went pretty well. Yes, it did. He was awesome in that movie. Yes, he was. That's a great, that's a great movie. That's an underrated movie, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He and Jamie Foxx are all He's awesome in that movie. So there is that aspect of like, is he going to dust off a side of his acting we really haven't seen for the last 15 years while he's been making Mission Impossible movies and kind of been relegated to just sort of franchise fare? The other thing I'd be somewhat excited about, 
is he typically he typically always comes with Chris McQuarrie as as a writer as a director and Chris McQuarrie has actually script doctored some of the Marvel stuff before but he he's actually for my money like he's one of the more consistent like solid idea generators in Hollywood who isn't like a huge name so if we get him in the MCU I think he he'd be an asset I think that's a guy who is very much like a chameleon and would help the universe in some way but it's an interesting story. And obviously we're going to get some resolution in less than a month in, as far as like whether we're going to see the first appearance of Tom Cruise in an MCU film in Doc Strange 2. But if we do, I almost feel like it will lend credence to this story that there might be something coming behind it between yeah. Kevin Feige and Tom Cruise, which is wild. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, let us know in the comment section below what you guys think of this possibility um very interesting very interesting next up thor four toys do it again but brian you're not as upset because of the lack of content with regards to trailers or anything for this movie that's done pretty much and is coming out what in two three months yeah, it comes out in july one of and the yeah, actors we, we have tweeted nothing out else. not one of the stars one of the actors tweeted out the trailer was done and they had seen yeah. it i'm like oh wow that's great when are we seeing it <laughs> <laughs> like, day before the movie comes out like when, when yeah, are we seeing yeah, yeah. it is the sh it is now officially the shortest gap between first footage and release of film every day that goes by Thor 4 is setting a new record. They are running this tighter than any other movie that, that Marvel has put out. So Why do you think that is? Be. The, I don't really know as it pertains to a trailer. There's a part of me that was like, is this somehow weirdly connected to Doc Strange 2 that they don't want anything out there until that movie is up on screen? Or... They're that confident that they're gonna still make bank. Is Marvel getting cocky in terms of when do they give us stuff they, that they can afford to wait a few months before to sh before showing us anything? I'll give you I'll give you one theory about the Doc Strange attachment. So we know it's not running in front of the movie, but what if it's running at the end of the movie, the way that the Doc Strange trailer ran at the end of No I, I, ran at the I, end of No Way Home? I think that's something that we talked about that is a possibility. It makes, that's what makes sense. At this point, that's what makes the most sense to me. And then it would also, it, the gap would be explained by the fact that Doc Strange 2 was pushed back. Because that would mean that originally they intended for that first trailer to be out there in February or March. Yeah. And because they rejiggered the production schedule, they just accepted that they were going to put it out later, but they wanted to stick to the plan of having it be effectively the end credit stinger of Doc Strange 2. Today is, April today is April 4th. No, today is April 14th, 14, 2022. And we're saying that the trailer is going to come out at the end of Doctor Strange 2 just like Doctor Strange 2 trailer came out. Um, had had they released a trailer before Spider-Man No Way Home? Nope. So I think this is something that we're, we're going to be seeing. And I think I said, I hope that they continue doing this, but it's been a while already. So, but that seems like the most likely scenario I think happening for... But in the toys, they 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 showed what um, Go the God Butcher is gonna look like. It looks pretty dope. Yeah. I'm very curious to see how that looks live action. I'm, this is gonna be very interesting to see Kristen Bell as a villain. Um, and in the MCU, something you know, because Kristen Bell is a is an actor. <laughs> you know, not to say that the other guys aren't. But he, you, I mean, he did Batman. You didn't think he would do anything outside of Batman. Um, and now he's in an MCU film. 
playing a really important character, a very interesting character. Um, very excited to see this portrayal. I think it's one of the most underrated stories in the genre this year. I, I gotta be honest, like yeah. Christian Bale as the villain in a Marvel movie and nobody talks about it at all. I, because we haven't seen anything, Brian. I get it, but I mean like, that's a big deal. Like it is. I feel like I feel like Thor four has gotten its fair share of press, but that press is really centered on kind of two main themes. It's been sort of the Hemsworth and Natalie Portman return, the Mighty Thor storyline, which is very famous and obviously should get a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. And then the second has kind of been the the cameos and the small parts, right? Russell Crowe as Zeus. Are we going to see Hercules? You know. Matt Damon reprising his his comedic, presumably his comedic role. I feel like that's the other theme. And lost in that shuffle, you have this Academy Award winning actor who always transformed, who's never bad, who swore off comic book filmmaking after The Dark Knight Rises and is back 10 years later. And as, as you said, the one thing I when I looked at the toy, I was like, oh, so we're pretty much not going to recognize Christian Bale, which may be part of why he wanted to do this. He's going to be totally transformed, costume painted, like all this sort of stuff to disguise him, although I'm sure his voice is somewhat unmistakable. And, you know, he really, ha you know, we talked about Tom Cruise not being a villain. I mean, Christian Bale hasn't really been like a true, true, true villain for the most part since American Psycho. And that was a pretty awesome intro to the mainstream world of, of adult Christian Bale. So, hey, very excited for this performance. It's one of the things that's anchored me amidst the worry that Taika is going to make this movie too silly. It's the idea that, like, I just don't, silly and Christian Bale don't go together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just have that trust that he's going to anchor this somehow. Did he do Shaft after or before American Psycho? Um, before. So Shaft okay. was 2000. American Psycho okay. was right after that. Yeah, it was kind of like okay. the next year, next year or two. Yeah. Got it. So, yeah. Got it. He, was, he was a pretty menacing bad guy in that, too. Walter oh, yeah, Ridge. yeah, yeah, yeah. He was good in that. He, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a good, he's a good actor, man. He does his, his, his work really well, man. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to see what sort of performance he brings to this character. Is he going to be up there, I don't think anybody can touch Thanos. Um, oh. But it, but will he be a memorable villain? Because if he's not, then that's a disappointment. Um, but let us know in the conversation below what you guys think uh, about this store for reveal in the toy of God, the Gore the God Butcher and how he looks. And when do you think the trailer is going to come out? Is it going to be after the Doctor Strange 2 movie? I can't think of any other scenario where it doesn't, especially during, you know, when is when is uh, Doctor Strange two coming out? May first week of May. First week of May. Yeah, can't be any later than that. I think the only yeah. question is, do, does it just come out online before that? But I don't know the doc, the way they the way they utilized that Doctor Strange trailer in No Way Home felt a little bit like a test drive of yes. like. I playing around with with a new tool and and, yeah, and it, yeah, yeah. i think it worked i mean look at what well, you're going to talk about the ticket sales i mean yeah the hype for doc strange too for the hype for a doctor strange movie Off good segue charge. good segue doctor strange through the ticket sales brian um people are talking about numbers opening weekend close to 200 is that possible? I think it may be possible only if it gets the same sort of, I guess, acclaim similar to No Way Home in terms of how good this movie is. If it proves to be that, then most definitely, I don't know if it gets this No Way Home numbers. No. But, but Brian, the hype around this movie in terms of what we're gonna see, we I we I still don't know what this movie is about. <laughs> you know, all I know is that we're gonna be jumping from place to place. I don't know. I don't know anything. Um, it's quite possible this movie may be 
uh, up there, perhaps even close to Spider-Man. Who knows? What are your thoughts? Well, the, people aren't just pulling this out of thin air. The first 24 hours of ticket sales were well in excess of the Batman. And we know that the momentum for the Batman built pretty relentlessly to where you got $135 million domestic and $260 million worldwide opening weekend for a three-hour film. So here you have a two hour film, which is outselling, which I'm not surprised it's outselling the Batman. Cause again, this is a sequel. This is not a culmination film, but it's like a big buzzword film. You got, you got a couple Avengers in here. You got multiverse in here. There's a lot of things happening that would get yeah, people yeah. excited. So yeah, I mean, the idea that You'd be, if, if, if Batman did those numbers at three hours, the Doc Strange could do 200 million at two hours. Yeah, absolutely in play. Um, absolutely in play with this kind of hype train. Now, I think you're right. You need reviews. You're going to need some reviews to at least, I don't think they have to be, No Way Home was about as highly reviewed a movie as the MCU has produced. It was in the top three or four. I don't think you have to be quite that high. But I think you got to be as, you know, you got to be at least at like the Captain America Civil War, like somewhere in that range of like high 80s, around 90%. Mm -hmm. And I will say, as much as we hate the cameos, if you see reviews and one-liners that are dropping stuff like, oh, you won't be disappointed by what else you see, that is going to add to that opening weekend box. There's no question, right? If you get yeah. hints that like, oh, you can't believe who pops <laughs> up in this movie, people are going to come out yeah, in yeah. part for that. So... Yeah, it, I just, it blows my mind that we're sitting, like the first movie was a nice movie. I think it's a nice rewatch, but it was like a 600 million global movie and it was a highly profitable, successful movie. The fact that we're sitting here being like, oh, this is a layup for like a billion plus <laughs> and it's like the event of the year for, for, for Marvel or for Disney. I'm like, that's a little, that's still kind of mind boggling me. It's like Marvel hasn't lost it if that's the case, you know? Yeah, I know, I know, I, I know. I sh I'm kind of overstating because I actually think I actually think we're all said and done. Probably Wakanda Forever is going to wind up being the event of the year just because of everything that surrounds it and the the mystery that surrounds it. But mm. yeah, I mean, the fact that Doc Strange as a character again has now been elevated alongside these other you know characters that are in the movie to where we treat that character as if it's like Superman or Batman, you know, it is is a testament to how Marvel builds this. Especially with characters that nobody, they weren't popular characters. I mean, That's amongst I mean. comic book fans, you know, they, you know, they knew of these characters, but they're not like the comic books were selling, selling off the, sh you know, shelf and or anything like that, like hotcakes. They, they were characters and they were pretty cool, but nothing world renowned uh, names or anything like that. And, and Marvel seems to just, revitalize these characters and make these, ca these characters more popular than, they, than they've ever been, which is amazing, which is difficult to do. To even do it with, listen, you thought Spider-Man was popular back in the day? Spider-Man now is, forget about it. It's at its peak in terms of popularity. Yeah, I think people, I think, yeah, I think, I think more people know about Spider-Man you know, Miles Morales has definitely added like a whole new dimension to that. Like people, people know more about it than just the classic red and blue friendly yeah. neighborhood Spider-Man. Like there's, there's like cultural knowledge of like Spider-Man, a little bit of the universe, right? Like those top level characters, almost everyone at least has heard of them or would recognize them upon seeing them. So you're right. I mean, the, um, I guess the only like the variables to throw into our discussion here about money is this movie we get in a China release and with China fully locked down, does it matter? It doesn't because it didn't matter with Spider-Man, right? Well, true, but it, I mean, like it did in the sense that Spider-Man No Way Home would absolutely have been a $2 billion plus movie and it, and it wasn't yeah. because there was no China. And so Marvel, if they don't, if this one doesn't come out, it adds to the list of like, why can't Marvel get any of these past the censor boards in China? And then, as I said, you got major cities in China that are on complete lockdown right now because of COVID outbreak. You know, the Batman had a, you know, was dominating market share, but nobody was going to the movies in China. So from a global box, 
this could be another situation where Marvel's losing 200 million plus because they can't, they can still get to a billion, but like they might lose $200 million of what they would have otherwise had as a guarantee yeah. four years ago because of, because of COVID and because of whatever's going on between the studio and the censor boards there. Yeah. Are you guys going to be seeing Doctor Strange 2 opening weekend? Let us know in the comment section below. Are you excited who you think is going to be in that film? Uh, there's just so many possibilities. And I still, and I, I haven't forgotten that, 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 uh, that take that you had with regards to uh, all the cameos being shown in the movie for Disney Plus. If you wanted to see everything, come to Disney Plus. We have a, or if you want to pay $5 or $10 to see the whole movie with all the cameos, it's, it, yo, this is going to be very interesting to see what happens in the next few months. Um, do you think Doctor Strange 2 is going to have a 45 day window? That'll be the baseline plan. I mean, that was that was the baseline plan for No Way Home, right? I mean, it obviously was altered because of the box office trajectory. So the baseline plan will be 45 days. The Batman has wound up being, I think it was 46 days. So, you know, mm -hmm. Batman was highly successful, still making money in the box office right now, but they're they're staying on plan. And it's coming next week, by the way. I'm pretty stoked to actually watch it again. Yeah, oh. yeah me too. Yeah. Um, next up what i mean hey if this is true i'm all for it i think this guy is brilliant i've never seen the animated show that people uh are very familiar with um what's the name of that show oh that he wrote um uh man i was gonna call it not lila and stitch uh rick and morty yes Yes. From what I heard, there's a very complicated narrative there because they go back in time and going all this all this stuff is happening and they just do it with such uh, I guess the writing for that show is so great that people tune in and he, and this guy Michael Waldron is responsible. Now, someone in a tweet I forget the name, Brian, you know the name? It was another. It was another writer. It was like another screenwriter, and it was, she was in a conversation with Waldron over Twitter. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the Twitter, they were he, he signed off, and she tweeted back at him, "Have fun writing X Men." <laughs> I think Left that was an that. oopsie, Daisy. Right and then it was like, "No, no, no, no! I was joking. <laughs> I was kidding." And then you all of we're sitting here being like, "Or were you?" <laughs> yeah, she wasn't kidding. Did you just I, I, or did you just forget? I think she forgot. I think she forgot. I think she realized what she said and she tried to backpedal on that comment. Listen, I I wouldn't be surprised if he is um writing the X-Men. X-Men I think is a it's a difficult path. It's a difficult story. It cannot fail. It cannot fail, Brian. You could say that about a lot of different characters, but this X-Men is like failing with Spider-Man. It can't fail. It's like failing with Batman. It can't fail. Especially if you have the right people behind it, which we would assume the MCU does have the right people behind this. So if Michael Waldron was on board to write the X-Men, I'd be very excited. Brian, what are your thoughts? A hundred percent. Now let's look at the breadcrumbs that would say, suggest this is not a joke. Fact one, we know that Marvel likes to ride its horses. When they find someone that they like, they love having them do multiple projects. They don't mess around. If they, they bring the A-team where they need the A-team. Michael, fact number two, Michael Waldron is absolutely the A-team now. After Loki, <laughs> He also was a lead writer on Doc Strange 2. So this is a guy they trust with projects big and small. And obviously Loki, incredibly well received. We'll see how Doc Strange 2 is, but he's definitely a reason to have confidence. Back three, the X-Men story they have to tell has to be a multiversal story. 
And this is the guy who's been writing the multiversal story, right? He's the guy who introduced it to you in Loki. He's the guy who wrote the film now in Doc Strange 2, which has Professor X of some kind yeah. in this movie as the Illuminati. They, like the breadcrumbs do point to this guy probably needing to be in the room or when where we're right, headed yes. toward no more mutants and all that fun stuff, right? That would connect the dots to where this guy's been writing. So I think those breadcrumbs line up. Yeah. I think there's, I don't know if you want to, what odds you want to put on it, 60, 40, 65, 35, that this was a real tweet that got out of, that was a mistake that he can't, they couldn't retract it. Now they're just trying to cover it up. I think it's an 80% chance. Okay, you're higher. Think, okay, yeah. 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 I, think, I think it's the majority chance. I, I don't think this was a April Fool's joke. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let us know in the conversation below what you guys think of this possibility. And we still haven't gotten into a real deep discussion about the X-Men, which I wanted to at some point. Um, there's just so much to discuss. We really got to sort of think about what, um, um, how to approach uh, the X-Men. Um, again, I've, I've watched the X-Men animated series and I think there's just so many great stories in there in terms of the characters and how they, they're done. Um, and it'll be very interesting, man. It would be a sad day if X-Men is not done right. And I don't believe it to be the case. I think they're definitely going to knock that, knock that out the park when it's said and done. Well, X-Men 97 is going to be on our top 10 list for 2023 right oh yeah, yeah. How, is oh, it, how is it not <laughs> yeah definitely definitely it's definitely my gonna be my top three i gotta see what else is gonna be coming out that year um it's gonna probably be a toss-up between the the batman the cape crusader and, and 97 because the way they left off i don't know if you remember how um the X Men finished. Do you re do you recall the final I episode? I haven't. I haven't gone back to the series in, in too long. So yeah. When you get a chance, man, you you gotta watch it. You gotta watch it. It, uh, it was very very interesting how they ended it off, and I'm looking forward to seeing how they continue that storyline because it ended us in in a specific way. Um, so how they move forward, I'm very excited about it, how they go. Uh, about doing that uh, for our final topic we said it, we talked about this a long time ago Brian May 15th and of last year May yep I think the episode was May 14th was it May 15th was it May 14th okay it was the middle of May we, was, we yeah. were listening to this we went back and walked, checked out yeah. The same yeah. <laughs> I went looking when Brian sent me this 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 article, I started looking for the episode that we talked about, it. and it's I, I, I'll put it in the description or in the in that little bar that comes out in the YouTube channel. Uh, but it was called uh, the the streaming wars. Like probably like ten minutes in, you, we start talking about what what's going to happen with the this merger and what's. Um, what's going to be taken over, how they're going to go about handling the people that work there. And Brian, you pretty much called all of it. They are, they are exploring um, how they're going to be dealing with the DC property. Brian, go ahead and, and, and just regurgitate what we already said a long time ago. So the, the Warner Brothers Discovery merger has been closed for less than a week. And I was sitting at my desk today and I saw the headline come across and I was like, oh, I'm texting Pablo right now. Because <laughs> I started looking for, I saw the headline, I didn't see the story. I was like, I gotta go find the story. Variety published a story today saying that David Zasloff is considering a complete overhaul of the DC Entertainment Division. He is seeking to consolidate, streamline, and harmonize all of their product, small screen, big screen, animated, live action, into a vertically integrated business segment with one person in charge, a la Kevin Feige. 
it is a this is probably the most hopeful piece of news that a dc fan could have seen come across except for those who are wanting the zack snatter universe back that's done and over with but go ahead <laughs> but you know number two it's exactly what we said in this episode a year ago which was you know they announced the merger the merger was a year away and at the time you know what we were talking about was like there's going to be so much noise between but just remember that legally Zaslov can't call the shots until he gets in the seat and we talked about a couple angles one of which actually you called exactly which was confirmed today as well um number one was leadership we you know, we said everyone's gonna go so right answer is almost everyone jason Kalar gone and sarnoff who runs the 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 warner brothers movie side she's gone so we got rid of them toby emmerich's gonna stay because he was a personal friend of david zasloff before warner brothers so as you see these people surround themselves with their people emmerich mm -hmm. is one of his guys emmerich got to stay which leaves walter hamada as sort of like We'll hear one. Limbo. Now, the Variety yeah. article suggests he will be involved in whatever plan Zaslav has. But then I did a little further digging. His contract is up next year. He's done. He's Dude. done, yeah. Done. He, that's what, when they say involved, he is the interim shepherd until his contract is up and he is out. Yeah. Which will complete the circle of what we expected. And what's interesting is Zaslav philosophically, I mentioned this when Kalar went out, that they weren't replacing Kalar's role. And Zaslav made a number of comments publicly now that he is the CEO, where he's like, I hate red tape. I hate layered. And I need to come up with $3 billion of cost synergies to meet the targets of this deal. But what are you seeing? He is cutting supervisory positions at every level and that's what consolidation streamlining vertical integration that's all what that's saying and mm -hmm. that's why he's looking for his kevin feige now interestingly and this is maybe the piece where you get a little bit worried it sounds like he's looking more for a business like a ceo under the ceo not a creative junkie, which is kind of what Kevin is at his heart. Like he's the biggest nerd in the room, which is yeah, yeah, really yeah. worked for him. Yes, yes. Zaslav's like, look, I need to, I need to make money. I got to get the shares up. So he's running that a little bit differently, which does worry you a bit. However, I do think what it suggests is, and this goes back to our Aqualad discussion, the internal competition for dollars is going to be really tight. Like it, they're not just going to hand out. Oh, we want that filmmaker. Here's 150 million dollars. Oh, you got that idea? Great. Here's 100. That's those days are over. 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 You're going to get the best idea, what they think is the winning idea. And if they think it's a 40 million dollar movie, that's what you're going to get. If they think it's a 250 million dollar budget, that's what you're going to get. But it's going to be a single view. And so I feel like a lot. In, if you like what they're doing with HBO Max, where they're kind of throwing this stuff up there, enjoy it while it lasts. Because <laughs> I think when these things kind of run their course, it's all going to oh, be boy. just posterity and done. What would you do? So the article dropped some interesting hints. And oh, by the way, I want to give you credit for something. You asked about the streaming services of Discovery HBO Max, what would happen to them? He confirmed they're going to merge them. So he confirmed it's going to be one streamer. Okay. Because they don't want to advertise for multiple, which actually makes sense. So you're going to have Chip and Joanna Gaines alongside Batman, <laughs> <laughs> basically, uh, in some form. It, it makes sense, yeah. Saves them money. And that's what, at yeah. the end of the day. And if they want the subscribers, those it makes pay. Yeah. Hey, there's an audience that loves everything that those two have done on HGTV. And that's going to yeah. be the place you have to go. And mm -hmm. then in your feed, hey, why don't you check out Robert Pattinson while you're here <laughs> as Batman? Exactly. Right? Exactly. Like, exactly. Tell your friends. Um, so I think the article specifically mentioned Superman. 
as a character that had been allowed to degenerate that needed to be revitalized. Yes, yes. I don't think that was an accident, Pablo. No other character got that type of treatment. That, right? that there shout was, out, yeah. There was the shout out to how well Batman's been handled, generally speaking, with Nolan Verse and now Matt Reeves. There was the general alluding to like the success of like Peacemaker or like, hey, they've had success with the one or the Joker. Joker got called out as like, hey, it's a good example of how you can take a character unorthodox way and make money off it. But Superman was the character that was highlighted as the priority to fix. I don't know, man. Like, it, it just made me feel like the Valzad, the Tanahasi Coast. I don't know that we're going to see those. I yeah. just. Those, I'm not them, saying they'd be I, bad. I just it just had that feel of like they want to wipe the slate clean. Sorry, Henry Cavill, and they're gonna just try to redo this from the ground up as if none of that had ever happened. That's what it felt like the beginnings of to me. I agree, and I think that's the, the approach that they need to take with these, with these, with this IP. They need to start from scratch. Um, the way Superman has been handled is like nobody wants to. I, I don't know if it's whether they find difficulty in writing a Superman uh, uh, story that 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 works. I don't know what the pressure is like for for you know having to live up to those um, Supermans that everyone loved, with Christopher Reeve, and some would say Henry Cavill. But Superman is a hard character to write. And you've had J.J. Abrams and, and some others who have tried to sort of change something about the Superman character, and it hasn't worked. Regardless of what Superman you want, you know, I want the Superman from Justice League, not necessarily Justice League Unlimited, because it's Justice League, he was the same character in Super Friends. <laughs> He was useless pretty much, except for some one of those where he has some cool moments. But the 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 show, the the animated show, Superman the animated series, um, it's it's a very hard character, and I've had my ideas of how you should do Superman. Um, but that's a, that's for another day. But Superman is supposed to be your money maker. And, but that's a hard one. It's a hard one, Brian. I don't know how. It's a, it's a tough, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. Yeah. Um, but I'm hoping that whatever the decision that they make going forward with DC, I hope they have a position for Bruce Tim if he wants it. I don't think he wants to be yeah. the main guy. I don't think he wants that sort of uh, title or role. I think he wants to be in the room when they're creating, let's say, universe. Because I think they want to they want to have the success Marvel is having. Why not? Why wouldn't you? Right? I've said this before. I said this a year ago. Why wouldn't you want the same success? If it's possible, you have everything. Why not? That's all I'm saying. I don't think I didn't read the article as as a a message that every single creative mind who's currently in the building is going to be thrown out. That's not what I take from the article. What I what mm -hmm. I mean is I think everyone's auditioning for their spot. So like I think we would say whatever we think of him like right now like James Gunn's got a spot, right? He's produced a hit TV show for them. He has a critically acclaimed, but like, but I think James Gunn is still going to have to fight for the next project in a way that he probably would not have under the prior regime. That's what I mean. It's like, he may have that next series that he's working on right now. And he may say, look, this is a hundred million dollar series, or this is a $300 million series for 10 episodes. And I just think that's going to be a harder sell than it was. Let me ask you ago. this. Does Peacemaker get done under the... If Peacemaker hadn't been done, does Peacemaker get done under this new <laughs> management? That's an interesting question. I mean, you know, I don't... I, 
maybe i mean i think actually you know i'll probably say, i'd probably say yes i mean even though it's not my favorite show i'd probably say yes only because i feel like again i don't i don't view the new administration as being like hey we're there's certain types of things we're not going to tolerate or certain types of things we're not going to do they're, they're they're after they want a diverse menu of great ideas and they want them to make sense alongside yeah. each other yeah. so there's clearly room for for comedy there's clearly room for you know dark drama there's clearly like, there's room for all that yeah what i'm what i'm getting from this though is that it's got to be efficient it can't be you're throwing 10 things up at the wall green lighting all of them and finding the one that sticks yeah. this has got to be a higher percentage you know proposition and I'm really interested to see where that goes. Now, I will stick by my one other prediction, which is even though I read this as, hey, he's looking for his Kevin Feige, and that's a, more of a, in his mind, more of a CEO business-oriented type. Sticking by my oh, prediction. Parliament members? You got it. That one, somebody from the parliament's going to get poached. They're going to put, they're going to make a godfather offer. And whether it's, you know, Nate Moore or Winterbaum or somebody else that's listed in the credits right now, they're going to hire them away as part of this overhaul. And that person is going to be the functional Kevin Feige for this. And that tool will replace Walter Hamada effectively. Yeah, That's yeah, the role. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll say this, Green, uh, that Green Lantern show, I don't think is happening. There's is happening? definitely a lot of things in the development pipeline that are going to get shut down. As I said, we predicted that before too. There, there was a foot race. These people were trying to get their stuff through the system, right? <laughs> and some of the stuff is far enough along that it will make it. Yeah, yeah. But the, some of the stuff that's too early definitely is going to get cut. Yeah. Very interesting situation is what I call it. Um, in my opinion the future of the dc universe i think is uh looking a little bit brighter i agree um it's certainly been as i said like up. you have to for you and i this yeah. was like the best piece of news in yeah in the last 10 years of dc yeah. i agree i agree and uh Hopefully we get to see these changes soon in terms of content. Certainly, obviously, it's not going to be this year, but in the next no. five years, I hope to see something at least in the in the beginning stage, their, their phase one, whatever version of that um, we get. I'm with you. I think the early, I think if we're thinking about things like um, fandom, I would say... I would probably guess it's like 2024 fandom would be like the first one where you would see a vision. I think 2023 fandom, you could potentially see like Hints. an individual project. Maybe, maybe the Superman project that could be on its own as a big new thing. But the, the universe, the vision for the universe, it's a years off thing. It's not a months off thing because you got to get it right. You can't mess this up again. Because you only get to blame you only get to blame the past management once. Yeah. This is gonna be very interesting, man. This is gonna be very interesting. I, you know who it's also good for? Mm -hmm. It's the best news for Marvel. If you're a fan of Marvel, this is great news. Why? Same reason why WCW was great for the WWF in the 90s. Competition. Nothing breeds greatness like competition. Yeah. And like the competition hasn't really been a competition. Yeah. Other than like a couple of Batman films. So this could be real competition. And we all win if that's the case. Of course. Of course. Listen, we can go on for hours talking about this, man. Because it's just, I can't wait for the next few years to hear what they have in store or how they're going to go about um, laying the foundation 
for the next iteration of whatever the DCU or DCEU, whatever it is, um, I would suspect that at least this year we'll hear more about it. Perhaps some hires, perhaps some rumors. We'll see. But um, Brian, any last words before we sign off? Yeah, I think the other thing you could start to hear in the next 12 months is projects that are being shuttered. That's the, that decision they can make. Yeah. Because that's yeah. is very hands on. And if he gets in there and he's like, I don't like that, <laughs> it's not happening. So you definitely, I think you're going to hear a few of these where the actor or the producer or the director will be out promoting something else. They'll get asked the question, what's happening with that show? And you'll get the, yeah, I don't know. That, that's not happening. Then I'm moving forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think we're yeah, we're definitely gonna get some of that. Green Lantern is not gonna get, it's not gonna happen. Superman, I'm listen. There's a whole bunch of stuff. Even my, who knows, Michael B. Jordan's stuff. Who knows? I, I don't think Static Shock is gonna not gonna go anywhere because that's that's a potential money maker right there. I think um, that's far enough along that it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's our show for today, man. A lot of stuff going on. Some very interesting stuff that we're going to certainly revisit in the future. Uh, perhaps for the for the next few years, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, this stuff and giving you updates. But uh, a lot of exciting stuff happening, man, in this genre, man. That superhero fatigue stuff still hasn't really set in for me, although we see a little bit of inklings of horribleness. That sort of says... Like, oh, Morbius, man. less than 10 million in second <laughs> week. I said 15, man. I was way off to the high side. <laughs> Yo. I don't get it, man. But I hope to have a conversation about that soon um, with Sony and, and, and the Craven movies. Because now they're turning into... Uh, Warner Brothers 2.0 almost over there on that side. Well, listen, if Warner Brothers gets its act together, it's going to make it's going to make Sony's Sony consistency does. stand out a lot more. Oh, hells yeah. Oh, hells yeah. I'm telling you, the pickets are going to the, 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 people are going to come out with their signs and it's, we're not going to we're not going to go see any Sony Marvel movies. We're not. But Let's see what happens. Uh, please, um, if you're still here, please hit that like and subscribe button. Hit that notification bell, share with your friends. Um, and we'll see you next time on the Nerd Gen Report.